Good evening, brethren and guests, and welcome to Burlingame Lodge's number 400, fourth Masonic guest speaker presentation in our monthly guest speaker series. My name is uh, Roberto Diaz Jr., and I'm the Worshipful Master of Burlingame Lodge number 400 in Burlingame, California. On behalf of our lodge, I would like to offer a great big fraternal welcome to all. We are very pleased to once again have you here with us. Before we start, Brother Aiden Cotter, our chaplain, will lead us in prayer. Brother Aiden. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Brothers, let us assume an attitude of prayer. Great architect of the universe, as we gather this evening to hear Brother John speak to us on the topic of Freemasonry and the birth of California, grant that we may be inspired by the timely significance of this talk. We reverently ask that we be reminded of the role played by our founding fathers in the birth of this great nation and their courageous sacrifice to fight against tyranny. We pray that the events of the past week in our capital make us mindful of the majesty of our unique US constitution that serves as a model of democracy worldwide. We ask that the freedoms bestowed upon us by our founding fathers, several of whom are our Masonic brothers, not be taken for granted lightly, but cherished and protected as the guiding principles of our lives and the lives of our future generations. This we ask in thy holy name, amen. So more to be. Brethren, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of our country. Uh, please remain silent and I will lead. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, helping us tonight, uh, we have, and you already met him, uh, Worshipful Brother Marty Cousing. Uh, he's a past master of Burlingame Lodge number 400. We also have uh, Worshipful Brother Gary Stevens, also past master of Burlingame Lodge. We have uh, Brother uh, Barry Kopp also helping us. Uh, he's our uh, junior warden and Brother Chris Edvincula. Uh, we also have, I believe, uh, Mrs. Heather Cooper, helping in the background there, uh, most worshipful. Thank you, Mrs. Cooper. <laughs> it's great to have you on board. Um, so without further ado, brethren, it is with great pleasure and honor to not only introduce, but also welcome again to our lecture series, most worshipful John L. Cooper III. Most worshipful Cooper is a past grand secretary of the Masonic Grand Lodge of California, having served for almost 18 years when he retired in 2008. In 2013, 2014, he served as Grand Master of Masons in California. He holds a PhD in education from Claremont Graduate School. And before becoming Grand Secretary, he held various teaching and administrative posts in public schools in California. Brother John has been a Mason since 1964 and is both a 33rd degree Mason in the Scottish Rite and a Knight of the York Grand Cross of Honor in the York Rite. His primary interest in Freemasonry has been the, the history and philosophy of the craft. And he has presented numerous papers at international conferences, including Bordeaux, France in 2019. In 2019, he, was also, he also served as the Master of Harmony Lodge number 164, 164 at Sierra City which was also happened to be on his 50th anniversary of service as the master of his mother lodge in Los Angeles in 1969. What an achievement. He has also served as master of both Northern and Southern California research lodges and is currently the master of Golden Compass, Compass's Lodge Research Lodge and Columbia Historic Lodge. Most worshipful John during his Masonic journey has served as master, at least on my last count, for a total of seven times 
and is a member of 11 lodges. We are proud to say that he is also a life member of Burlingame Lodge number 400. Most worshipful, Hooper will be presenting this evening Freemasonry and the birth of California. Most worshipful John, the virtual floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Worshipful Master, and it's a pleasure to be joining with all of you again this evening. Also, very pleased to have a panel of members of Burlingame Lodge that will help shape our discussion as well this evening. Uh, let me give you just a very brief background before we actually begin the presentation so you can understand where this presentation came from. Um, I had the privilege in June of 2019 of presenting a paper in Bordeaux, France at the International Conference on Masonry. And the paper itself was much longer than the brief presentation we'll be sharing this evening because with a worldwide audience, I had to explain things that to all of us with our American background uh, were, uh, were not as knowledgeable. And so the paper itself discussed the origin of some of the things that we would find a uh, background behind what we're seeing this evening as a matter of course. Uh, in addition to that, I would like to issue a disclaimer at the beginning of the title. Uh, by talking about Freemasonry and the birth of California, I really am speaking to the birth of the current state of California, the title of the presentation is the same as the paper presented in Bordeaux, but I don't mean by this to be disrespectful to the heritage that we have as Californians before that. Certainly our Native American heritage, which stretches back for thousands of years, is an important part of our background. And then of course, California was part of the empire of Spain under the Viceroy of uh, Mexico, and then after 1821, California as a province of Mexico. And so of course, there was a California before the era that we'll be talking about tonight. I also want to explain how I chose this topic. We have been aware of the interest of the academic world on Freemasonry for a long time. And one of the most prominent scholars associated with that is um, from UCLA, Dr. Margaret Jacob. Many of you have met her through our International Conference on Masonry, which happens uh, or has happened for several years in the spring. Margaret discovered that Freemasonry had a significant role to play in the creation of civil government, what we would call today democratic government. Her primary study, of course, was on the continent of Europe. An American scholar, Dr. Stephen Bullock, picked up this theme and analyzed the role that Freemasonry had in the creation of the United States of America. Knowing this, I was interested as to whether or not Freemasons had ever been involved in any other experience in nation building. And indeed, I discovered that we had, and that's what you'll be seeing this evening about the birth of the state of California and the role that three prominent Freemasons played in that. So if you will allow me now, I'm going to see if I can share the screen properly on here and um, we should be ready to begin. So there we are. And I'm gonna start up here and see if this goes. Pardon me just a moment. I've got to go back in here and see if uh, this is being shared correctly. Plus, we're sure we can see it correctly. Are we? Okay, very good. Then I'm set up and ready to begin. Thank you. I'm doing a little different than my normal presentation has been with two screens. So hopefully, um, Marty, you'll catch me out if something doesn't work right and we'll go from there. The uh, first slide that you see there is actually a picture of the interior of a building 
still in existence, a California historic landmark in Monterey, California. And if you're ever in Monterey, you want to take an opportunity to go through because you can learn a tremendous amount about what I'll be talking to tonight in person in a very interesting building that is there. The hall, in this hall, the first constitution for the state of California was drafted in 1849. Now, I want to just remind you of what you remember from your high school days. As the United States pushed westward, we came into conflict with Mexico. And in 1836, Texas uh, separated from Mexico, uh, really under the complete uh, leadership and control of Americans who were settling there. And Mexico became a, an independent nation. It remained as such until 1845, when they petitioned to join the Union as the state of Texas. That precipitated a war with Mexico, which began the next year in 1846. And as a result of that war, not only did Texas remain a part of the United States, but we also obtained the territory westward from there on the Pacific coast, California, and of course the states in between that are now the states of Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico. Our story is concentrating just on that period leading up to the creation of the state of California as a state of the American Union in 1850. There were 48 delegates to California's first constitutional convention. Nine of those were Freemasons. And of these nine Freemasons, three were significant contributors to what California would become. Let me go over here and move the slide to the next one. I think it's important to make a comparison between the creation of the American Republic, our own foundation, and what happened in Colton Hall in Monterey in California in 1849. On the uh, slide in front of you, you see on the left-hand side, the interior of the room where the Declaration of Independence was written and adopted in 1776. And in that same room in 1787, when the Constitution of the United States was written. On the right is the exterior of that building. We call it Independence Hall, but it was at the time actually the State House, the State Capitol, as we would call it today, of the state of Pennsylvania. There were 55 delegates to that convention in 1787, and of those delegates, uh, 39 of them eventually signed the Constitution of the United States. Of the 55 original delegates, 14 of them were Master Masons. When the Constitution was eventually signed with only 39 delegates in Philadelphia, nine of those were Freemasons. And I thought it was of some interest that in California, in our convention, we also had nine Freemasons, and all nine of those signed our first constitution. Masonic principles had a significant impact on the creation of the Constitution of the United States of America, and it also had a significant impact, as we'll see tonight, on the creation of the first constitution of the state of California. The Constitutional Convention in 1787 in Philadelphia was presided over by a Master Mason, George Washington, a member of Alexandria Lodge near his home of Mount Vernon. The California Constitutional Convention of 1849 was presided over by another Master Mason, Brother Robert Semple, who was a member of our Benicia Lodge number five. This is a picture of the hall where the California Constitution was written and adopted in 1849. It was written between September 1 and October 13 of that year. Now that's in contrast to the writing of the federal constitution 
1787, they convened in May and adjourned on September 14 of 1787 when the convention that had written it was adjourned. Monterey, the location of Colton Hall, had been and was at the time the capital of the Mexican province of Alta, California. And before that, it was of course a frontier province of Spain. This place was therefore the logical place for California's first constitutional convention to assemble. At the time that this, these events occurred, California was governed by a military governor. In 1846, the first year of the war with Mexico, American troops landed from ships and uh, some from overland and essentially through a series of battles defeated the local uh, forces uh, of the provincial government of the province of Alta, California. During that same time period, however, California was interested in becoming a state in the American Union, but this was held up by the first or by a significant crisis in our national life at the time, the decision as to whether adding another state to the Union that would be a free state rather than a slave state was of major concern and consideration. So therefore, even though California could have come into the union from 1846 on, it didn't happen because this difficulty had not been resolved. Toward the end of that period, in 1848, gold was discovered in California and huge numbers of non-Californians, non-Californios as they were called, flooded to what was to become the state of California from around the world, but particularly, of course, from the United States. And there grew an, an increasing interest in forming our own elected government in California, not waiting for Congress to make up its mind as to what they would do with this newly conquered province, but setting up and establishing our own government. So therefore, on June 3, 1849, the military governor of California, Bennett Riley, issued a call for a convention, which was to convene in Monterey, then the capital, and for delegates to this uh, conference convention to be elected on August 1, 1849. They were elected, 48 of them, and the convention convened in this hall at Monterey on sept Saturday, September 1, 1849. I mentioned earlier, just by way of comparison, there were 48 delegates to this convention and nine of them were Freemasons. In the earlier constitutional convention for the United States, 55 delegates were elected, 14 of them were Freemasons. And when the constitution was signed, there were only 39 that remained to sign it and nine of those were Freemasons. This is a, uh, an engraving of Robert Semple. He was then the treasurer of Benicia Lodge number no. five at Benicia, California. Uh, Semple had become a Mason actually in Davy Crockett Lodge number no. six in San Francisco in 1848, a lodge no longer in existence, but he demitted to Benicia Lodge number no. five at Benicia. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with where Benicia is today. It's on the northern shore, northern um, uh, edge of the Sacramento River, very close to where the Carquinas Bridge crosses the Carquinas Strait. And that was fortuitous because this particular uh, location was actually set aside as the third capital for California. We migrated it from Monterey to San Jose, we were there for a short time, and then to this town of Benicia, which became the third capital of California and was to remain that until Sacramento became our capital. Robert Semple was a dentist by um, profession, but actually he was a real estate developer and he owned significant amounts of property in this small town of Benicia. 
In addition to that, because there was no bridge across the Sacramento River at that time, Robert Semple created a ferry. And with the huge number of gold miners coming to California to San Francisco and then heading up for the gold fields, crossing the Sacramento River was especially important and his ferry made a very great deal of money. As we'll see very shortly, Robert Semple also was passionate about the concept of free public schools. And so he made an arrangement that all of the profit from the operation of this ferry at Benicia was to be given over to the creation of the first public school system in that community. This is a picture of the oldest Masonic building in California, and it's at Benicia. The land that it was built on was donated to the lodge by Robert Semple, and he lent them a lot of money to the members of the lodge to actually build that. Uh, this building has an interesting history on its own. You can still visit it if you wish. It's now owned by the Grand Lodge of California, and we have, by last count, three lodges that are actually meeting there including um, a new Venetia Lodge, which um, got his charter or received his charter at the last annual communication. In addition to Robert Semple, Myron Norton, a member of California Lodge number one, was an important delegate to and a participant in the debates. Myron Norton was a San Francisco attorney as well, well, of course, a member of California Lodge Number no. 1. At the convention, he was the chairman of the committee that actually drafted the Constitution. And therefore, in many respects, he can be considered, uh, if you will, the author of the Constitution in that he wrote it. The Constitutions of New York and the Constitutions of Iowa were two of the ones the convention used as examples to uh, draft our own constitution. And so there is some background behind that. As an attorney in San Francisco, Norton, Brother Norton was a defense attorney for a group of vigilantes who were accused of crimes against immigrants from Chile. Turns out that Norton was passionate about the right of every person to have a fair trial. And I ask you to keep that in mind because I mentioned earlier, um, the passion of Robert Semple about public schools was matched by this passion of Myron Norton for making sure that every person would have a, a fair trial. The third one in our discussion is Lansford Hastings. Lansford Hastings was a member of the convention, a delegate from Sacramento, and he was a member of our Tehama Lodge number three at Sacramento, one of the founding lodges of our Grand Lodge the next year in 1850. Tehama Lodge is now known as Tehama Union Lodge number three through consolidation. Hastings was convinced the California Constitutional Convention should not exclude anyone from uh, the freedom of religion clause in the Constitution. And his particular interest was to protect the rights of Mormons. The convention seriously debated excluding Mormons from the clause. And you must remember that in during this time period, that particular uh, denomination was a very controversial one uh, for reasons that too long ago to go into our discussion this evening. I wanna just add a, a point, however, we have to be careful in Freemasonry about thinking that some Masons are heroes in every aspect or respect of their lives. And while that's true for, for many, if not for most, it may not necessarily be true for all. So as, as a um, interest of transparency and as a disclaimer, Hastings was a passionate believer in the Confederacy. He became a major general in the Confederate army 10 years after the time period that we're talking about. And at the end of the Civil War, he worked on a project to create a new home for Southern slave owners who could no longer live in their mind, if you will, 
in the United States and were moving to Brazil. Their descendants still live in Brazil and are called to this day the Confederados. So another interesting story for another time about Hastings' involvement in that. This is a picture of the first California Constitution. The original is housed in the State Library at Sacramento and is put on display from time to time. Notice that it's beautifully uh, engrossed and handwritten here. Uh, it's a, as all documents of this time uh, were, were beautiful documents. And this one, just like our Declaration of Independence, inscribed on parchment. This is a picture of the proceedings of the convention called the report of the debates. Just another contrast with the Constitutional Convention of 1787 in Philadelphia, our United States Constitutional Convention did not keep any proceedings or records of the debates in Philadelphia. The primary reason was that they were worried that if the arguments that they were having over creating it got loose, that that would pretty much sink the ship on whether or not the Constitution would be ratified. So they agreed to meet in secret and they agreed to have all of their proceedings confidential. James Madison, who was secretary of the convention, kept elaborate notes. And to this day, that is the only way that we really know what happened in the debates in the United States Constitutional Convention of 1787. The California situation was different. We were not concerned that the people not know about what was happening. In fact, we wanted to make sure that they did. So the proceedings were printed. They were not secret. And the volume on the left is actually a reprint, which is in my library, of the report of the debates of the convention. And by reading those debates, much of the background information I'm presenting tonight becomes very clear. So you can confirm if my interpretation is correct by getting a copy and reading it. By the way, it's also available online in a PDF format. From our purposes tonight, there were three major issues under discussion that involved these two, three prominent Freemasons. The first I've already alluded to the issue of public schools. Robert Semple wanted the Constitution to guarantee a right of a free public education to all students in the state. Myra Norton was anxious to guarantee in a Bill of Rights, or as we call it in the California Constitution, the Declaration of Rights, the right to counsel when charged with a crime. And as I mentioned earlier, of course, Langford Hastings was very anxious that religious freedom would extend to all religions. This next one is an actual quote from those, the proceedings of the convention to show you how passionate uh, Robert Semple was. If the people are to govern themselves, they should be qualified to do it. They must be educated. They must educate their children. They must provide means for the diffusion of knowledge and the progress of enlightened principles. It's difficult to, I think, realize that even at this date in 1849, the, the experiment of democratic government or of a representative democratic republic was rather new on the world scene. The United States was the first to try this in any large scale environment. And there were many things that still had to be worked out about that. Those who believed that free government would survive believed also very strongly that it required citizens who could read and write and who would understand the basic principles of self-government. And that's what Robert Semple was saying in this quotation. Myron Norton was committed to the idea of equal justice. And as a member of California Lodge Number no. One, he may have been influenced by what Freemasonry has to say on this subject. All of you know in our monitor, we have this statement that justice is that standard or boundary of right which enables us to render unto every man his just due without distinction. This virtue is not only consistent with divine and human laws, 
but is the very cement and support of civil society. And as justice in a great measure constitutes the really good man, so should it be your invariable practice never to deviate from the minutest principles thereof. So um, I am sure that our, our good brother had that in mind as he was at the convention dealing with this issue. Lansford Hastings was, as I mentioned earlier, passionate about the concept of freedom of religion. And the convention was all set to vote on granting and guaranteeing freedom of religion to all the citizens of the state, except for Mormons. Hastings objected, and you can read in the debates his comments about doing that, part of which he said, if you start down that slippery slope, you will eventually live to regret it because your own religious persuasion may come up for exclusion at some time. Well, this is the language that actually ended up in there, remembering that um, our other brother, uh, Myron Norton, was the one that, that wrote the actual final language, the free exercise and enjoyment of religious profession and worship without discrimination or preference shall forever be allowed in this state. And no person shall be rendered incompetent to be a witness on account of his opinions on matters of religious belief. But the liberty of conscience hereby secured shall not be so construed as to excuse acts of licentiousness or justify practices inconsistent with the peace and safety of this state. Now that's a pretty long statement. I want to compare just for you the much more brief one that appears in the Bill of Rights in the United States Constitution. It says simply, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So in 1849, we're trying to define what that really means and what it should be applied to noting the standard exception in law that you can't use religious opinions to, if you will, excuse acts of licentiousness or practices that are not consistent with peace and good order in society. Let's take a little closer look at the Bill of Rights and ask why a separate set of rights in the California Constitution was so important to the convention and to these Freemasons, and frankly, to all of us. Just a bit of the remembering your own history, the original United States Constitution as it adopted, uh, sent to the states for, for ratification in 1787 did not have a Bill of Rights. And there was a reason. The assumption at the convention was that the powers listed in the Constitution were delegated by the states. And so if a power wasn't listed, then it didn't exist. It wasn't a problem. So the argument was made that if there's nothing in the Constitution that says that you can restrict freedom of religion or freedom of press or assembly or guarantee other rights, then it's not a problem. Well, it was pretty obvious as the Constitution was being debated in the various states that it was not going to be adopted unless there was an, an assumption that someplace along the line, quickly after the ratification of the Constitution, that a separate Bill of Rights would be added to it. And with that understanding, the states approved and ratified the Constitution so that it came into effect in 1789. And very quickly, Congress proposed a series of amendments to create what we call today the Bill of Rights. Um, when they were ratified, they proposed 12 of them. 10 of them actually got approved or ratified as amendments to the Constitution. And so those first 10 amendments are called the Bill of Rights. Something that a lot of Americans don't understand is that for the first half, if you will, of the 19th century, the Bill of Rights in the United States Constitution only applied to the federal government. 
it did not apply to the states and did not apply to units of local government. So if, for example, the First Amendment says Congress shall pass no law respecting an establishment of religion, if you looked to your state constitution, you had to find some right stated there if it was going to, if you will, restrict the power of your particular state government. All of the original 13 states had some form of a Bill of Rights within their constitutions. And that was important because at that time, that was the key, if you will, to guaranteeing the rights that most Americans would ever come up against in their lifetime. The Civil War caused the Constitution to be amended to protect some other rights that were important. The 13th Amendment, for example, prohibited slavery. The 14th Amendment, however, adopted in 1868, was in response to attempt of some of the governments in the South to strip citizenship and rights from the newly freed slaves. And out of that debate, the 14th Amendment was adopted. It's a fascinating subject in its own, but we can't go into the process of how it happened tonight. The key phrase in that is, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. What that did is to, over time through Supreme Court decisions, apply the Bill of Rights to everyone, to all levels of government. And as a result of that, most Americans today, if they're looking for their rights, tend to look at the Bill of Rights in the United States Constitution, forgetting that in 1849, this amendment had not been adopted. And in 1849, it was extremely important that the California Constitution protect rights that would be important to Californians. Incidentally, just as an aside to show you the effect of that, uh, many of the states, several of them had established churches at the time the United States Constitution was adopted. And it wasn't a violation of the United States Constitution then because the 14th Amendment had not come into existence. Most of them abolished that connection over time. The last state to do so was Massachusetts. Up until 1833, the Congregational Church, the Puritan Church, was the established church in Massachusetts. Its ministers were supported by tax funds, and there were other privileges granted to members of that church which were not granted to those that did not belong to that church. Article 9 in the 1849 Constitution had something to say about public education. Now remember that I've spoken to, to Robert Semple's passion for having a free public school system in California. Well, first of all, of course, the Federal Bill of Rights said nothing about a right to a public education. But by the 19th century, most states were experimenting with the creation of some type of public tax supported schools within their jurisdiction. And it was gradually coming to be a common understanding that the right to an education was a natural right like all of the others that were in the, um, the federal constitution. Simple pushed for the constitution to guarantee a right to a public education system. He did not win. This is the clause on your screen that the legislature put, or that the Constitutional Convention put into the Constitution, and I'll explain in just a moment why it's not exactly the same thing as a guarantee to a free public education. The legislature shall provide for a system of common schools by which a school be kept up and supported in each district at least three months in every year. And any school neglecting to keep and support such a school may be deprived of its portion proportion of the interest of the public fund during such neglect, which means if they don't, if the local uh, authorities in a school district don't have a school, 
then they don't get any money. Well, that's not exactly the same thing as requiring every district to have a school because if you don't have any funds to have the school, you're not gonna have a school. Uh, Semple tried to get the legislature to guarantee that it would be funded from taxes. But the language that ended up in the schools here is a little bit different than that. This uh, public fund is actually was actually at the time uh, a public trust fund set up from the sale of land. Uh, as uh, public lands were available in California and they were sold, some of those funds were to be placed in this special fund to support schools. So it wasn't taxes per se, it was, if you will, the interest earned by a public fund. Oh, and incidentally, we're talking at that time only um, elementary schools. High schools were not considered any place to be a part of the common school system. Uh, and what we would call an elementary school or a K-8 school today was what really they were talking about. This is the home of Harmony Lodge number 164 at Sierra City. As in the introduction, they said that I had the privilege of serving as its master in 2019, the sort of a way of celebrating the 50th anniversary of when I was master of my home lodge in Los Angeles. The building was built in 1861 and the lodge room is on the second floor of this building because it's built on a hillside. You enter the lodge room from the back of the building by climbing the hill. The lower floor, which is now a rental space, was when the building was built, uh, an assembly room. It was used for a public assembly for the community of Sierra City. And in there, the first public school in Sierra City was organized and conducted. For actually for a number of years, as many lodges in that time did, they gave this space contributed to the public for use as public space. So Freemasonry supported the first public community and in many communities throughout California during this particular time period. Even though Semple didn't get what he wanted in the constitution, another Freemason was able to do it uh, some dozen years later. The first constitution did provide for the election of a superintendent of public instruction. The fourth of those was a teacher and a school administrator from San Francisco, a brother by the name of John Sweat. He was the California superintendent of public schools from 1863 to 1867. Uh, he was a member of Oriental Lodge number 144 at San Francisco. Its current name is Phoenix Lodge number 144. And I have the privilege of being a member of that lodge as well as a member of Burlingame Lodge number 400. Uh, Semple was able to get the legislature to adopt a law requiring public supported schools, again, elementary schools in every district in California. I want to talk a little bit now about uh, our brother, uh, Myron Norton, a member of California Lodge number one. This is the section from the 1849 Declaration of Rights, our own Bill of Rights. And the key part of that is in the last part of this phrase, the party accused shall be allowed to appear and defend in person and with counsel, as in civil actions. This was not universally a uh, right, if you will, in those days in other state constitutions. In some of them it was, but not by any means in all of them. Uh, Norton believed that it would be impossible to have a fair trial if you could not be allowed to have an attorney represent you, because the law was so complex in his mind that only somebody who was trained in the law could properly make sure that this right was guaranteed. I should tell you that in the history of American constitutional law, it took a long time for this particular uh, understanding to finally become a nationwide standard. It's only about 35 years ago that a Supreme Court decision of the United States held that the right to have an attorney was absolutely essential 
to the right of a fair trial. And so uh, in our own constitutional law in the United States, it took a long time for us to recognize something that Norton said was absolutely essential when California adopted its first constitution. And of course, uh, our third of our trilogy, our brother from Tehama Lodge, number three, was responsible for urging this particular clause in the Constitution governing uh, religious freedom. And I referred to that earlier when I talked about how it was a little bit more elaborate than what our own federal Constitution was at the time. Guaranteeing, if you will, uh, in, in ringing terms shall forever be allowed in this state and no person shall be rendered incompetent to be a witness on account of his opinions on matters of religious belief. That by the way, was to protect Quakers. Uh, members of the Society of Friends would not take an oath. So when you see somebody in court and dramas and so on with a hand on the Bible, uh, swearing that they will tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help them God. Uh, in many states, members of the, uh, the Quakers could not be a witness because they wouldn't swear an oath. Their religion forbade that. And so in our California constitution, this clause made sure that Quakers were not excluded by that. And of course, the main one from the debates was that uh, Hastings was concerned that Mormons would be excluded. By way of conclusion, where we've been with this, I've got a timeline up here, uh, just so that you kind of understand how it fits in. The war, which had begun in 1846, uh, a truce was declared, hostilities ceased on January 10 of 1847. And I didn't put in here uh, January of 1848, but that's when gold was discovered at uh, uh, Sutter's Mill. And when the word spread, California experienced a huge influx of uh, people into its, uh, its territory. On February 2, 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed with Mexico, permanently ceding Alta California to the United States with some other provisions within that. And then on June 3, 1849, Bennett Riley, who was our military governor, calls for a constitutional convention. The delegates were elected in August. The convention, actually, I should say September um, 1. I, that's a typo with that. September 1 is when they actually convened, which was a Saturday. And they adjourned on October 13, but the convention ended. On November 13 of that same year, there was a vote of the people in California, and the Constitution was ratified by the voters in California. So tonight we've looked at uh, some things that happened in the birth of the state of California, if you will, in this room. When you go there, you'll still see the quill pens on the desk and the writing papers and things that are, are set out. Uh, it's almost as if you could step back in time and have participated in that. It's uh, well worth your time to do that, remembering that 48 delegates that met in this room Nine of those were Freemasons, and of these nine Freemasons, in my opinion, three were significant contributors to what California would become. And now comments and questions and things like that. Let's see if I can end this share up here. Uh -huh. I think I can. Back over here to do this. Have we ended the share? Are we back in good yes. shape now? Thank you, Most Worshipful. Fantastic presentation, like always. Uh, it's always a pleasure listening to your orations. Uh, and I believe we probably have a few questions ready in the back. Uh, worshipful, uh, I, I do have a question for Most Worshipful John. Uh, most worshipful, I know you mentioned early on, uh, prior to our statehood, there were discussions uh, whether or not California would, be, would become a free 
versus slave state. But it sounded like that the discovery of gold in 1848 really kind of fast forwarded that, that decision for, towards statehood. Do you think that if the gold weren't discovered that it would have prolonged um, our path to statehood or do you think uh, we would have still been able to progress that same down that same timeline? I think without the discovery of gold that our progress to statehood would have been much longer. If you study how states were admitted to the union through the years, you find that the normal process was to have an organized territory with a territorial government and after a certain length of time, a probationary period, if you will, then Congress would vote to admit the state to the union. Uh, California was embedded in this national debate about slavery and adding a free state to the other side of the scale uh, was something that was a, a, a real problem for the slave states. So as a result, it was delayed for a long time and I suppose that one could argue that California was so important to the union that if that hadn't been an issue, that we might have then organized a territorial government and eventually been admitted to the union. I'm using, I guess, as a reason for that is that if you go up to Oregon, which was also settled during part of this time, that they became a state in 1857, just seven years um, after um, California did. So uh, it's entirely possible that it, um, it could have been organized as a territory if it wasn't. Thank you. Any other questions for Gary? And to remind all the attendees tonight, uh, down below you have a button down there that says Q&A. You can send in your written question. You can also hit that raise hand button and that will alert me to show me that you have a question and we can always answer that live as well. Well, if I may, I actually have a second question <laughs> for most worshipful. Uh, so, most worshipful, so my other question is that uh, prior to the state of California keeping uh, reports of debates and proceedings in the Constitu Constitutional Convention, were there other any other states that had done that previously, or were we, yes, were we one of the first? Most states had no problem with uh, mm. public knowledge of what they were adopting. Um, First of the state constitutions were actually created before the United States Constitution, uh, obviously, because these were newly independent states after the Revolutionary War came to an end. And debates on what these constitutions should consist of were a part of public debate as well as uh, uh, debates in the convention. The problem with the federal convention was is that there was no agreement as to what kind of a government that we should have. And if you recall a little bit of your American history from that, the Constitutional Convention was actually authorized only to revise the Articles of Confederation, which were a very loose treaty, if you will, amongst independent countries. When they got there in May, it wasn't very long, they decided they couldn't do that. If they're going to have to fix the problems, they had to adopt something that was a real constitution. But they didn't want the word to get out too quickly, because if it did, they might have had um, all kinds of public protests against that. Um, you should realize, of course, that the recent events that we've been experiencing this last week were not necessarily unknown to the founders of our country. Uh, one of the reasons the United States Constitution was created in the first place is there was a great fear that mob rule would take over in some of the individual states. And that was the background, frankly, of the, the reasons why the Constitution was put together as it was. Thank you. I have a, a comment and a question. Uh, I don't see any other questions up here. Uh, most worshipful, I'm at, this is a tiny bit off, to off topic. I'm not sure how much you've read about um, Leland Stanford and what he um, and his history coming to California, but he started out his career in, I believe it was Wisconsin as an attorney and his attorney building burned down. He just was recently married. He's probably in his early 20s and his wife wanted to move to New York, he convinced her to move to California because his brother, Leland Stanford's brother, was moving to California because it was 1849. And Leland Stanford moved to California, said, forget this lawyer stuff. And he, and he opened up a mining supply business in California. 
and he became just about the richest guy in California, which that or the United States, which actually was the richest guy in the world. And that's how he got started with Leland with uh, Stanford University. Yeah, uh, that's that is correct. And, and you do more know more of the details than than I have uh, dug out in in my reading on that. But uh, Stanford was a fascinating individual. Um, he um, was a merchant primarily. A lot of those that came to California made their their fortunes, if you will, outside of the profession. I mentioned only uh, um, Robert Semple, who was a dentist, but he didn't make his fortune by being a dentist. He did it in property speculation. And so you know, one of the most salient examples was Leland Stanford. He was a Mason in Wisconsin. He did not ever become a member of a California lodge, although he had a California lodge named for him, our Leland uh, uh, Chico Leland Stanford Lodge up in uh, Chico, number 111 is uh, uh, named for him. Oh, did not know that. Uh, my, my question was then, um, Davy Crockett Lodge. Do you know anything about that, the history of Davy Crockett Lodge? Yes, uh, I'll tell you who is the real expert on, on that. Adam Kendall, who is a uh, past master of Northern California Research Lodge, as well as a past master of Phoenix Lodge 144, has extensively studied that subject. And it's really tied up with our third grand master, uh, past master of, and the organizer of Venetia Lodge. Um, too long a story to tell here, but Davy Crockett Lodge got crosswise with California Lodge number one. And out of that quarrel and out of the trial, the actual unmasonic charges trial against our third grand master, um, the members of Davy Crockett Lodge scattered and that lodge went out of existence. Mm. I'm encapsulating a long and fascinating story that Adam has done in, in a major paper. Uh, he, he's gonna do a reprise of that paper for Quattro Coronati Lodge this next year. So if you belong to that, you'll get to read a first rate academic study of that situation in the early years of our Grand Lodge. Hmm. Most worshipful, have, we have a question from uh, Joe Becker here. Oh. Uh, most worshipful, the, um, the debate uh, upon uh, California becoming uh, a state that could be possibly a free state, um, was, was there at the time uh, a, a recognition of possible wealth that either could have gone to the north or the south um, in the battle that ensued during the Civil War. And California was rich in natural resources, certainly a huge amount of uh, wealth uh, for mineral wealth um, at a later date. Was, uh, was any of this discussion um, part of uh, what transpired um, into not being able to make a decision about California being a free state and then they just move forward anyhow in California, but were there industrialists involved in this perhaps uh, um, yeah. over this period of time? Yes, there was. And remember, if you go from 1849 forward to 1860, when these debates are taking place uh, about the, the, the lead up to the Civil War, Californians who came from the South were very anxious that, that California join the South. And the, the core of their strength was in Los Angeles in that area. So uh, it's very possible had they been able to prevail that they might have taken California into the Confederacy or failing that, setting it up as an independent Republic on the, on the Pacific and keeping the tax money and the gold from flowing to the union. Uh, in our presentation, we had on the, uh, uh, Thomas Starr King, one of the things that I quoted in there was uh, Abraham Lincoln's comment about Thomas Starr King was that he believed he was solely responsible for keeping California in the union. Uh, the tacit statement behind that is, is if it hadn't, and if the, the, the Confederacy had uh, instead received the gold from California, the gold fields, it's very possible that the Civil War would have gone in a different direction. So, yeah, I, I think it was an important thing. And Californians were deeply divided on this issue. 
Our good brother, Peter Champion from over San Luis Obispo is a great historian of this. So if you ever have a chance to hear Peter Champion, Brother Champion, talk about that uh, in his researches, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. We came very close to joining the Confederacy. Thank you. I have one, or actually I have two, <clears throat> if I may, most worshipful. The first one is simply a fact question and the second one involves a Masonic uh, situation as well. That question, did Brother Hastings at that time, is that the, um, the Hastings College of the Law, was that College of the Law named after this particular Hastings? It's just a fact question. Uh, the answer is no, it is not. It was named for a different uh, non-related uh, person who was, uh, he was also a Mason, but he, he was a different person. Oh, okay. A former justice actually from, a, from the Supreme Court in Iowa who migrated to California and was responsible for founding our School of Law at, at Berkeley. I see, all right, yeah. well, thank you for that clarification. The Masonic question was um, discussing these numbers, lodge numbers in the early days, California number one particularly, there's a lodge I'm sure you're familiar with up near Reading called North Star number two. But I understand, to use one of your words, they came uh, crosswise with the lodge here in San Francisco as to who is really the number one lodge in California. Any uh, ideas on them? <laughs> well, it's Western Star number two. And, oh, Western Star. Yeah, and it's located uh, on the edge of Redding, California, in the town of right. up there. And their claim to being the oldest lodge in California is they received they believe a charter from the Grand Lodge of Missouri as number 98 on the rolls of the Grand Lodge of Missouri and that they had that charter before the ancestor of California number one got its charter. California number one got its charter as lodge number 11 on the roll of, what was it, 13? I think it was 13, to check my number on that. Uh, the Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia California number one's claim to being the oldest lodge was that they maintained they had actually activated the charter by opening the lodge before Western Star did. But that's not really the true story. The true story I uncovered in some research some time back. In a nutshell, here's what I believe happened. Five lodges met together in Sacramento in April of 1850. And on April the 19th, they agreed to form the Grand Lodge of California, elected the first officers, including our first Grand Master for that. They agreed to come back on the 8th of May to receive their charters. Well, the delegates went home and they came back. Well, it was easy for California number one to come back. Well, they took ship up the Sacramento River and it was easy for Tehama Lodge number three because they were in Sacramento. It was easy for, um, Jennings Lodge number four, because they were in Sacramento. And it was easy for Benicia Lodge number five to come up the river from Benicia as well. Western Star didn't show up. And uh, their difficulty to get up and down the state when before you had I-5 or, or 99 <laughs> was a little bit difficult in those days. Not sure. The Grand Secretary at that time, well, what was the deal with Pihod? was um, also the secretary of California Lodge. So my suspicion is that he called the roll and said, California Lodge number one, California Lodge number two, not here. You go out of the rest of them. And so when they handed out the charters, the charter by the first grand secretary got handed to his own lodge. Now that may be fair to our good brother Gihon uh, after all these years, we can't prove it, but uh, I, really think that the fact that Western Star didn't show up uh, was what happened. Thank you, interesting, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, you, usually, most worshipful, usually if you don't show up to something you're elected, I guess uh, that was not the case. <laughs> now that's sort of a part, part of leadership is showing up, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Western Star's claim is pretty valid. If you, uh, when you receive a new charter, you're supposed to return your old one, but they didn't do that. They kept their original charter and it's on display if you want to see it sometime in their uh, vault museum that they have in the building up there. 
Thank you. Any other questions, brother? Most forceful, I do have one question. A um, couple of months ago, we did have um, worshipful brother Jordan Yelnick come speak to us about the moder modernization of lodges and going to the model of smaller, closer, more intimate lodges. And I'm sure because of the demographic and, and the geography of what California was like when Benicia was around, um, can you speak to what the day in the life, so to speak, of a member, what they would see in Benicia and perhaps why they consolidated or why they kind of fell out of the larger premier lodges that, that came about afterwards? Okay, well, let's see if I can understand the question in the context where we're here. First place, if you want to see about the size of our earliest lodges, you can do so very easily because in the first proceedings of our Grand Lodge, every year we reprinted a list of the members of the lodge. So you can go to the proceedings and find who the members were. We stopped that in 1911 because it was just getting to, to be too big a volume for us. And the lodges were small. Um, if the second part of the question has to do with what happened to those lodges, California number one, obviously is still in existence and meeting in San Francisco. Western Star number two is still in existence and meeting up uh, just outside of Reading. Tehama Union Lodge number three is still meeting in San, uh, Sacramento in our downtown building. Lodge number four disappeared within the first couple of years. The, the story of that one is that they gave away all their money to deal with the, um, the pandemic of that uh, year. I, I'll have to look in, in my notes to tell you the exact year. I think it was 52, 53 along in there. Um, but the reason for their surrendering the charter essentially was is that they had no more money. Money had disappeared. There's some controversy as to whether or not the common story that's been inherited about their giving it all away for charity or whether or not they borrowed the money and had to pay it back, but that's the time for a different one. The Lodge of Venetia was always a controversial lodge from the very get-go, and it was actually tied to the problem that you asked earlier, someone asked earlier about Davy Crockett Lodge number six. Venetia's dispensation came from an irregular Grand Lodge, and the members of the other four lodges were a little concerned about that when they actually held the first meeting of Grand Lodge. The charter came from a Grand Lodge associated with an irregular Grand Lodge in Louisiana that had been, uh, if you will, planted in Louisiana by the Grand Lodge of Mississippi. They were called York Masons. And because of that controversy, uh, they had to sort of agree that they would look the other way about the source of Venetia's charter. Um, as many of you may know, that there's a personal connection with that for myself. Venetia Lodge got itself into uh, internal quarreling and arguing with each other. And several grandmasters had to deal with that in modern times. Finally, when I was grandmaster, I had the unfortunate responsibility of recommending to our Grand Lodge that the charter be revoked and it was by vote of Grand Lodge. I was very pleased that a group of Masons in Venetia decided to revive the lodge with a new number and our meeting in that historic building now. So if you will, Venetia Lodge has come back, but it isn't uh, linearly the same lodge uh, whose charter was revoked. Right. Thank you, Most Worshipful. Thank you for agreeing to be here this evening and presenting us with such a timely and relevant topic. These are indeed uh, historical times for our great nation and now more than ever, Freemasonry is not only relevant, but it is very much needed. Thank you, sir. Uh, before we retire this evening, uh, I would like to give special thanks to all the help and support from our team. In the back end, uh, we have our worshipful Brother Marty Cousing, thank you, brother. Worshipful Brother Gary Stevens, thank you, sir. We have uh, Brother uh, Chris Edvincula from all the way from Colorado. Uh, brother uh, Barry Kopp, thank you, sir. Our chaplain tonight, uh, Brother John 
Aiden John Cotter. And uh, of course, uh, last but not least, um, Mrs. Uh, Heather Cooper. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, helping us and helping your, <laughs> helping your husband there in the, in the back end. Really appreciate all that. Brethren, uh, thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, we look forward to having you again uh, for future speakers. On February 9th, we will have uh, Worshipful Brother, uh, pardon me if I mispronounce this, Tuk Pham, who will be presenting the six days of creation through Masonic symbolism and the esoteric zodiac. Um, on March 9th, we will have uh, Worshipful Brother Carlos Diaz. He's going to be presenting the Entered Apprentice Tracing Board and a flyer with instructions on how to register will be forthcoming like always. So brethren, stay well, please stay safe and have a great evening. Good night, my brothers. Thank you.